Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome by my colloquium. Uh, I'm very great. I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Cez Rodriguez Julio as today's by my colloquium speaker. Uh, he got his PhD uh, from uh, Max Planck Institute for Dynamics of Complex Technical System. Uh, and then he did a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School and MIT. Then he became a group leader at the EMBL Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, currently, he is the professor of biomedical informatics and data analysis, University of Heidelberg. Uh, he is also co-director of the Dream Challenge, as you know. Uh, he has worked on uh, uh, various projects. In particular, in particular, uh, he has investigated how large biological data set can be uh, incorporated with mathematical modeling to uh, reveal the molecular basis of disease as a means to develop novel therapies. So I believe uh, today his talk is related with uh, this topic. So please join me welcoming uh, Dr. Uh, Says Rodriguez. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's great to be here to say share some work with you. And um, indeed so, our group is broadly, broadly interested in how to use different types of omics data, proteomic, transcriptomic, metabolomic, and so forth, data that we can collect uh, across many samples, uh, thanks to recent developments, and to use this to better understand diseases and ultimately to improve therapy. And uh, the way we would go about this in general is uh, if we have this very large complex data set, we would try to use uh, tools from statistics or machine learning to identify patterns in the data that either I, are, for example, associated with uh, the development of a disease, or we will try to build predictive models that then allow us to, to estimate, let's say, which therapy is going to be effective on a particular patient. Uh, as an example of such data that we have worked quite intensively in the past, it's a large collection of cancer cells that are treated with drugs. So this is led by Matthew Garner, the Sanger Institute, and they have around 1,000 cell lines. You measure the transcriptome, but also mutations, methylation copy number, and also the proteome. And you treat all of them with a large number of drugs, around 400 drugs, also now in combinations. So you measure for each of these cell lines how to respond to all these drugs by looking at the survival for increasing amount of drugs. This is typically summarized by the IC50, how much you actually need to kill half of the cells. Then you try to relate this response to drugs to the molecular features that uh, you have measured. And we and many other groups have tried a large number of approaches for doing this, tools from statistics, machine learning, from very simple linear models to more advanced things like Bayesian multitask learning. And while certainly there has been a lot of progress and, and we have uh, Kind of better handling on this on this uh, challenge, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that in general the predictability is relatively limited, at least for most of drugs, and even more the interpretability. So understanding why, uh, let's say, a particular drug kills a particular cancer cell is uh, limited just by these pure data-driven approaches. So that is the reason why we have a strong focus in the lab in supporting machine learning and statistical methods with existing biological knowledge. So there's a lot of things we know about the molecular processes, another type of biological processes. And our emphasis is how to use this data to extract signatures that I will show you in a moment. And then the signatures that are, for example, the activity of a pathway are fewer than uh, the original number of genes. Instead of 20,000 genes, you may have 100 pathways. And this reduction of dimensionality increases the statistical power of whichever method you use. But also, uh, because they are rooted in known uh, biochemical processes, the mechanistic interpretation is also increased. Mm -hmm. So that is the core message I would like to convey today. And I will walk you through different ways how we apply this uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. And all the tools and, and resources uh, I will walk you through are free and available in our website. So we're really happy if they are useful for you. 
The first, if we are going to use prior knowledge, it is very important to have access to it. So there's tons of databases out there, mm -hmm. which is complementary knowledge. And that's why over the years, we have been building this resource called Omnipath. So Omnipath is just one-stop shop to access over 100 different knowledge resources. Uh, we put a strong emphasis on curated knowledge, so knowledge for which we have annotations. So we have over 2 million annotations. Uh, and we started with molecular uh, pathways, like networks. But then we send it to other type of knowledges, such as annotation of localization, or something that will come later when looking at single cell uh, RNA data, information about cells of communication. And uh, I like to mention also that we have recently refactored Omnipath as a knowledge graph. And by doing so, Sebastian Loventanzer came up with a more generic language called BioCypher that is rooted in an integration of ontology or harmonization of ontologies across domains. And by doing so, we can now combine things like what you see in Omnipath, which is all molecular knowledge, which knowledge in other domains, such as clinical trials or, or genetics or you name it. And I can tell you more if you're interested. But so never, regardless of how you access the knowledge, the knowledge has always, or different databases, different knowledge has typically trade-offs between uh, coverage and quality or focus in particular type of um, um, biological context. And then because with Omnipath, you can access so many different resources and try with them. It's similar to when you wear glasses that you, you try different lens and you pick the one you see the best with. So with Omnipath, then you can pick the right resource for analysis at hand. And just to emphasize this point that the knowledge is, is limited, although helpful. So in a recent review, so Martin Garrido did an analysis where we took from Omnipath information about phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, so a key molecular process involved in signaling. Then we look at the publications behind this knowledge through the notations. And then one thing you see is there is a weak but uh, uh, an important correlation between the degrees on, on the network of the specific nodes of the specific uh, uh, proteins and the number of cetacean. So this means our knowledge, our networks that we use for analysis are biased by what we have studied, right? So it's not clear if, let's say, a hub in a network is more connected because it's more important or because simply we have studied longer. So, and second, most of our knowledge comes from the cancer concept. So here you see the proportion of knowledge and a lot of things are <laughs> things related to cancer or even to death, right? So, so we have a lot of knowledge of the cancer disease context, which again is not clear how much of that holds for other context. Okay. So keeping that in mind, we nevertheless, I think you know, prior knowledge can be very helpful. And uh, one way that we try to think about this is that we can use prior knowledge to extract information uh, about key processes of interest from their footprint on omics data. So there's the following. Many times we want to measure the activity of key molecular processes, for example, transcription factors. But it is hard experimentally to measure with high coverage and throughput the activity of transcription factors. But we have omics data, like transcriptomics. And if we know how my process of interest, let's say transcription factor, activates uh, or affects the transcriptome of a specific genes, and this is what I can get from cuts and links from prior knowledge, I can estimate the former from the latter. So some examples of this in transcriptomics, uh, one would be to use it to estimate pathway activities. Right? If I have a pathway of interest in the cell and I want to know if it's active, I can look at the changes in the target genes if I know them. Mm -hmm. Another one is transcription factor, as I said before. If I know the target genes of a transcription factor, I can use the changes to estimate activity of transcription factor. And the same idea holds for other type of omics, not only transcriptomics. If I have phosphoproteomic data, the phosphorylation of proteins is driven by kinases, so I can use the phosphorylation to estimate the activity of kinases. And if I have metabolomics, the metabolite changes are driven by metabolic enzymes, so I can use it to, to study them. So regardless of the type of omic data and the type of, of prior knowledge that I, I want to use to estimate these footprints, at the end of the day, what I do 
is to perform some type of enrichment, mm -hmm. right? And there are many methods from very simple over-representation analysis to gene set enrichment analysis to AUCL and Viper. And to facilitate the use of these different algorithms, we develop a small tool called Decoupler that allows you to run all these methods or even a consensus across them on any given omics data and any given type of knowledge. And this figure is just to show that actually the algorithm can affect the results. And then that's why it's important to try different methods and also try if uh, if you can to look at consensus. And this is available in a bioconductor package, but also Python as part of this SCverse uh, uh, environment. And in particular, the Python version is very fast. So it works very well for single cell RNA data. So that's a bit of how we think of extracting features from omics data to get these uh, footprints of process of interest. But we are even more interested in bringing this together in an integrated manner in the context of networks. So these networks, again, we can take them from our database Omnipath or from any other place. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we, we, we take information in particular about sign and directed interactions. So that's a particular protein activates or inhibits another one. So having that knowledge, which as we discussed before, we know it's biased and incomplete. We try to combine this with omics uh, of different types, different algorithms to identify the causal paths, causal networks that connect the different uh, um, changes in, in the molecules of interest. Uh, there are many algorithms to do this type of analysis. Uh -huh. uh, you can start from uh, graph theory features like shortest path, diffusion methods, uh, other more advanced graphical theory methods, Bayesian networks, neural networks. And we in particular have focused in the last years in using interior programming uh -huh. uh, as a simple but very efficient way to reconstruct causal paths in network from mixed data. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, I like to say we are in the process actually of expanding our workflow or our framework to include some of the other algorithms. But for now, what I will show you is based on the use of integer linear program. And the intuition behind this analysis is very simple. So imagine you had a very small network like the one here, and uh, you want to understand why when a protein up here on the left is active, and a protein here on the right is also active. And in your network, imagine, you have three potential paths that are connecting them. So the green are positive arrows, the red is negative uh, effect. So we would exclude the lower, if you think uh, with human reasoning, we will exclude the lower um, path here because there's a negative effect. So if uh, this one is active and this one is active, it will block this and it will not activate that one. And then we will have two candidates and in normal case, although not always, we would say I pick the upper one because I take the shortest possible path that is compatible with my changes. So, and that's really like the, the whole uh, intuition behind the approach. Of course, for large networks of thousands of edges, we don't do this manually, but we use an algorithm and here's where integer linear programming comes as a very powerful uh, strategy to solve this. And we have now updated uh, our underlying intelligent programming framework it's called Cornetto, Core Network Optimization, which can be applied to different problems where you want to solve ILPs. And it's available already in GitHub and we have a manuscript on, on, on the works. Nice. Uh, but now, so how we bring this back to the omics data and in particular to the multi-omic data. Uh, so I told you before, from transcriptomic, phosphoproteomic and metabolomic, you can estimate key uh, molecular activities. And then what we do next is we try to project this into a, into a network and, and use this interior linear programming to find the causal path that connect them. For this, we have this framework called COSMOS, which stands for Causal Integration of Multiomic Data with Prior Knowledge. So the idea is what I saw you before of passing this path with ILP, but just to, to make it a bit more concrete, this is an example. Uh, in a collaboration with the groups of uh, Rafael Kraman, Christian Fritz, and Jesper Olsen, where we had access to kidney cancer. And then uh, what uh, materials, so our colleagues look at the tumor and the corresponding healthy tissue. They perform mass spectrometry and RNA-seq, from which we call transcriptome, phosphoprotein, and metabolome. 
<clears throat> using this footprint idea, we estimate the activity of transcription factor, kinases, and metabolic enzymes. Mm -hmm. And then with Cosmos, we try to find the causal paths connecting them. Mm -hmm. So if you apply this, you start with a very complex variable. You see it on the left, coming from Omnipath, but also Recon 3D, metabolic network models, and Stitch, a database of protein metabolites interactions. And this gives us to over 117,000 interactions. So here we map these kinases, transcription factors, and, and metabolites. We apply this into linear programming, and at the end, we get a network as the one you see on the right. So still is a relatively complex network, but certainly less so than the one on the left, with around 400 interactions. Uh, and then uh, these interactions, when you zoom in, uh, looks like the one here on the left. So because we use sign-directed knowledge, we can find sign-directed interaction that spans the molecular processes we have measured for. So you see metabolic enzymes, the triangles are transcription factors, and these rhomboids here are post-translational effectors, such as phosphorylation. Uh, and uh, then what this allows you, right, is to boil down into a number of well-defined hypotheses. So all these paths that you see highlighted are able to explain or compatible with the changes that we see in this kidney cancer. So what goes up or down in the kidney cancer compared to the healthy tissue? Mm -hmm. uh, and it provides a molecular mechanistic explanation for that. Uh, but I should say at this point that uh, these methods are providing explanations that are hypotheses. And we should always take them as a place that we need to look into more detail and validate. So we are, why? Because we are using data that we know it's imperfect, incomplete, noisy. We are using prior knowledge that we also know is imperfect and incomplete. And the algorithm is adding important also um, uh, constraints and simplifications in the problem. So that's why we always say these methods provide us hypotheses that need to be further studied. But nevertheless, we think they're helpful because you can style from very large and very complex omic state sets, a relatively constrained sets of very well-defined molecular interactions to be looked at in more detail. So to summarize uh, this part of the talk, uh, uh, I tried to explain you how we use knowledge to extract first these footprint features from different omics data sets, uh, and then how we bring them together with large prior knowledge networks to try to extract uh, key mechanisms from multi-omics data. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to move now to single cell, but I don't know if there is any questions or you would prefer to leave them for the end. Uh, yeah, if you have any question, please feel free to uh, ask. And by the way, Julio, uh, in your screen at the top, uh, there is a menu blocking your slide a little bit. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, how this one? No. Okay, if um, not, it's okay, but slightly. I think I just have to do this with a high floating. Better, no? Mm, same. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. Because I, I don't see this now there on the top. Oh, uh, okay. That, it's totally fine, I think. Yeah, it's okay. Yes. So why don't we move? Yeah. 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 So exactly. Now I, I like to move to single cell RNA. So all the things I saw you until now are meant for bulk data, in particular for bulk transcriptomics. Mm -hmm. uh, but single cell data is, of course, very powerful and allow us to look at individual cells, but it comes with a number of challenges, uh, including the fact that uh, the coverage of genes is much more limited. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to apply these ideas there, but first we wonder how well would they work? And so we perform a number of benchmarks that show that to large degree, these methodologies from um, bulk can be also applied to single cell data. And the main reason why we think it works is because this footprint, which is the effect of the process interest is typically composed by a bunch of genes, let's say 10, 20. And even if you don't measure them all, you can still measure a few to get a robust signal about the process of interest. Uh, and just to illustrate the use of these methods, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through a recent study that we did in the heart with colleagues in Nathan, Rafael Kramer, Ivan Costa, Baden Hoisin, Hendrik Milting. Here we're interested in understand was different in the heart uh, that is suffer infection mm -hmm. versus a healthy one and a chronic failing heart. Mm -hmm. And the same is in the both intra intercellular level. 
So we had access to samples from patients from which we had collected a single cell RNA-seq, also spatially resolved RNA-seq, so measurements of different spots of the tissue. I will show you that in a moment. And even as an additional molecular layer, we have a TAC-seq. So TAC tells you about how open is the chromatin of the DNA. So in theory, it's informative of the regulatory potential of cells. So we try to combine this data set to understand our failure. Uh, one thing that is important to keep in mind, so for spatially resolved transcriptomic data, there are different technologies. Some have very good resolution, so you have true single cell spots on your tissue, but a limited number of genes. Another one, the one we used, is called Visium from 10 Exonomics. It has a very good coverage of genes, but each spot of the tissue is not small enough that it captures a single cell you typically have a group of cells. So then one thing that you need to do then, or you can do is to combine this with a single cell RNA to uh, estimate the cell type composition in the, in the different spots. Uh, and the other thing that then you can do is on each of these spots apply the tools we discussed before of the footprinting, right? So we're not show you the, the analysis of the cell type composition. Uh, it's in the paper, but I wanted to illustrate here how you can now, um, um, in each spot, right? So you see here, the figure, all these three figures are uh, information of a particular tissue uh, material from a patient who has chronic heart failure. Mm -hmm. So from the cell type composition, we, we see an estimation that there is a large amount of fibroblast in two parts of this tissue, two subtypes, so less one and two. If, if you are thinking this is a chronic heart failure, it makes sense that it has uh, fibrotic tissue, fibrotic cells. And then accordingly, in the same places where we see the, the fibrotic cells, we see a, a high activity using our footprint methods of TGF beta. So this is a major driver of fibrosis, makes sense. And also higher activity of transcription factor downstream of it called E2F4. This is just to illustrate how you can apply these methods to, uh, in this case, specially resolved uh, transcriptomic data. So that, but in this, uh, uh, yeah. that niche region has some special meaning in the heart or it's a random? Say again? Uh, the enriched position, the very bright position has some special meaning in the heart or it's just randomly occur there? The bright, bright, uh, bright places. Is it the spatial information, right? Yeah, exactly. This is spatial information. And so the bright, uh, in this case, corresponds to, if you mean on the figure on the top left, uh -huh. it means uh, the activity of TGF beta. So actually, the uh, light yellow is a medium uh, activity. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's a medium. Oh, but that place has some so that, meaning. Oh, that place has a some okay. special, that place has a some special meaning there. Uh, well, all we can say is that we see this activity level of these processes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, probably indeed it's important for, for that reason because the pathway is very active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. But what, what I wanted to say next is, uh, so we are just uh, visualizing the activity on specific spots, but we are not truly exploiting the fact that uh, we know what's happening in a particular spot and what's happening in the neighboring spots. Mm -hmm. And to really explore that information, we develop a framework called MISTI, which allows us to dissect spatial relationships using multi-view machine learning. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, like in the spot before, if I wonder why something here is red, uh, I, want try, I can try to uh, see if a machine learning model explains the changes in a particular spot by the changes in the neighboring spots, or perhaps is more influenced by the more distant spots. And uh, applying this in this mystic framework, we can perform different analysis on this data. Uh, it can be applied to any specially resolved data, not only to this special transcriptomics. And uh, I will not go into, into the details of, of this analysis. It's uh, either in, in this publication here or, or in this, the heart study where we could use it to try to better understand how, for example, the presence of a particular cell type in a spot is defined by the presence of other cell types in the neighboring, or if the presence of uh, a particular cell type is defined by having particular active pathways in the neighboring cells. So they allow you to start to understand a bit this structure of the tissue. Mm -hmm. 
I want to go back now to, to the first example I showed you before. So I kind of switching gears here again and not so much on the on the on the single cell. So I, I told you how um, uh, we, we started to we, we started to analyze a lot of this drug response data with machine learning and we found that uh, machine learning didn't work very well. So that's one of the motivations to use prior knowledge. And uh, we also tried to address this question of drug response in the context of the dream challenge that was mentioned before. Right, and the dream challenge, what, what we do is we try to pose questions to the community and the community try to address them with different methods. And by doing so, we can have an unbiased assessment of um, strategies and also improve reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And this can be also run on even confidential data like patient data by using virtualization containers. Those enables to gather the wisdom of the crowd by bringing a lot of methods and can be applied to many areas of, of systems biology. And, and here is some of the different areas we, we apply this to or more at the molecular level from gene regulation to uh, signaling pathways to also spatially resolved data like the one we saw. But uh, we also run this in a couple of different variants in the context of drug response. And again, it's similar to, to what I see in the previous slide. So we try to see if we can predict uh, the effect of drugs on a subset of cell lines here with question mark, uh, given information on other cell lines. So here in training by using different omics data. And when we ran this challenge and we had 44 teams participating, we also found that uh, the, the prediction is not very good. So this is just uh, the prediction of the different participants, each column, and the red line is random. So all but one team were betting at random, but they were far from perfect. So this parameter here should go all the way up to one to define a perfect performance. Mm. So, so then the, the bottom line is the productivity is very low. It was not only what I saw you with our research, also in the context of the dream challenge, we found productivity is very low. Mm -hmm. And this also is something to, to, that puzzles us for a long time. Now, why is predictability so low? And there are many reasons uh, we could discuss, uh, and there are probably a number of factors that contribute, but I think there is an aspect that is often uh, unappreciated, which is the importance of, of dynamics. Uh, 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 and. Uh, the, 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 I like very, very much how uh, Tony Latai put it down. Uh, so Tony Latai is an oncologist at Dana Farber in Boston, and he makes an analogy between predicting drug efficacy and understanding what happens if you hit a dog with a stick. No? And he says, consider trying to predict what happens if you poke a dog with a stick. It's an analogy to current approaches in precision medicine. We kill the dog, sample its tissues for all sorts of omics at the initial condition, and then use this huge amount of terabytes of data to make a prediction. And then he says, you know, the, the, the complementary functional approach is to poke the dog with a convenient stick and see what happens. Right, the point is biological processes, in particular, the effect of a drug is an intrinsic dynamic uh, process. And uh, we are trying to predict a dynamic process. So how a cell responds to a drug from uh, static, information, which is the multi ohm complex initial states of the cells. And there is a lot of value on complementing this with information of how cells respond to perturbations. So that's why I, I, I talk a lot before about how we use knowledge to support machine learning, but we and other groups also try to use dynamic model. So computational approaches that use um, the time response to perturbations as a means to understand under underlying processes. And we cannot do this at the same scope, like the multi ohm and machine learning. We have to be focused. This is more complicated, both experimentally and computationally. So, but what we can do is to use the output of large scale machine learning and unbiased omics profiling to select case studies to go deeper with this dynamic model. And for doing this over the years, we develop a methodology and tools called CellNap and Phonems that take data after perturbations and again prior knowledge coming from Omnipath to build so called logic models. And so these logic models are simple description of the molecular process in the cell by analogy with an electrical circuit with logic gates and so forth. But still, they can be built as dynamic models so we can monitor over time different features. 
And by being simple, they, they, they also scale up very well. So we can do this for relatively large networks. And there are different formalisms we can use. So the, the logic models in their simplest form are Boolean models, so on and off, but uh, they can also be uh, expanded to, to more complex formalisms such as ordinary differential equations. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, we have looked at how to apply this to different types of data, both bulk and single cell, both antibody-based, mass spec, and, and many others. Here is a bit more of detail what's behind CellNAP. So as I said, data with different conditions, prior knowledge of Omnipath or SPML and others. Then we have different model formalisms. As I said before, uh, we can be binary, we can do Boolean models. For this, we can rely in the interior linear programming uh, study I mentioned before. But there are other model frameworks all the way to using differential equations. And, uh, and uh, 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 we can also do different type of analysis, such as bootstrap cross-validation and, and different analysis to better understand the models. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to, to go a bit into the underlying computational problem, what at the end of the day we're trying to do is parameter estimation. Mm -hmm. so we're trying to optimize uh, uh, our model. We try to fit the data uh, uh, to minimize the this agreement between the measurements, this time course data, and the model predictions, and we also have a constraint of model size. So you can think that there is very interesting algorithmic problems that we can discuss more if you are interested of how to fit these models to, to complex data sets. Uh, and there are challenges, including the huge search space and many, many options to, to explore of because there's maybe hundreds of parameters that can be continuous and, and also there are different model uh, solutions that can explain the data. So I, I want now rather than going deeper on the on the more methodological questions that again I'm happy to discuss just to try to illustrate its value. So as I told you we we try to use this approach to better understand why we cannot predict well the response to drugs on cell lines. Mm -hmm. And we focus on particular cell lines where the drug prediction was poor. And then we did a deep dive with this dynamic modeling, which requires data set after perturbation. So you take the cells, you put ligands and drugs, and then you measure different readouts. And then what you can do is to take for each of the cell lines, this dynamic drug response data, this time courses data, and take a generic network and by this process of parameter estimation, uh, fit the model to the data. And by doing so to each cell line differently, you can at the end get a cell line specific models. And then these models, we, we ran them in, in some studies. One was in colorectal cancer, uh, and we used it to find uh, biomarkers and, and most effective drug combinations. And one on actually single cell, um, I will show you a bit more in a moment, on breast cancer. Uh, and so just to show you this last example, this was work with the Bernbaud and Miller's lab in Zurich. Um, so they had to look at uh, breast cancer cell lines. Mm -hmm. They had done night time course data. So you see here over time uh, for a particular cell line, how different markers, how different proteins evolve when you stimulate them with a growth factor or combined with different inhibitors. So these inhibitors block specific kinases. And depending on the perturbation, you get different time course for 29 different phosphoproteins. So then we can use this data in the framework cell that I told you to build this logic ODEs. So these are dynamic models that uh, capture the, the changes on, on the different pathways. And, and just to illustrate here, for example, is the difference networks between two cell lines. So these are both breast cancer cell lines, but they are quite different. And uh, And, uh, and then we can then use it to, to look at the differences between these two different cell lines. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I had to do something. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is all very nice on the context of cell lines, mm -hmm. but uh, it is important also to consider how we can apply this to patients because in the cell lines, we have a lot of material so we can uh, better um, generate all these complex data sets like the one I saw you here. But so, if we try to apply, yeah. 
Julio, so in this case, the ODE model is automatically generated with uh, using the uh, cell. Semi-automatic. Yeah, so you would start with building the network. Let's uh -huh. say uh, you could use Omnipath or yeah. all your knowledge. And in fact, in this case, we had to do some manual um, expansion of, of, the, of the existing knowledge. Uh -huh. And then you fit it to the data more or less automatically. Okay. So then you get you get the parameter values, which the different parameter sets defines the the final model. So it's a, I would say semi-automatic process. So it it's done in the cell and opt. It's exactly cell and opt in this huh? framework. You can do the whole process of taking the knowledge, taking the data, uh, do the parameter estimation. Oh, nice. And then we borrow tools from other other places. For example, for the optimization, we use tools from the group of Julio Banga for uh, optimization and or other tools. Yeah. So here, mainly the hill functions are used for the regulation function. Or you're right. Exactly. Okay. It's kind of phenomenological. So of course, it would be more accurate to use biochemical reactions and mass action law, mm -hmm. but. Given the scale, uh, uh, we simplify them uh, uh, as a first approximation. Yeah. I see. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the last thing on this context I wanted to say is that um, uh, so this data is very nice, as I was saying, but this is on cell lines. Uh, but ultimately, we would like to understand these processes in patients so that we can use them to better understand treatment in patients. But there we have much less material, right? So it's more relevant, but it's much harder to get material. So to uh, one case where we can get good amount of material from patients is from the blood. The blood is more accessible. And in fact, we, we did a study on the blood of patients with multiple sclerosis. And then what we were able to do is to, to do this approach with up of, in this case, collect blood from 148 donors, patients and, and, and controls. And again, for, for each patient, perform a, a number of perturbations. Uh, and then um, this allows us to build donor specific models. And by comparing the models of the different donors, so the patients versus the healthy controls, uh, identify potential combination therapies. So this is illustrated here. On the left, you see the model. Uh, it's a model, as I said, of, of the blood cells. So the immune cells in the blood, it covers most of the major process or signaling processes on immune cells. And then by looking at the differences between the components that are active only in healthy or only in multiple sclerosis patient or in both, mm -hmm. we came up with an hypothesis that was then validated in a mouse model, mm -hmm. uh, which was that the combination of two inhibitors, TAC inhibitors on finger remote, should have a, a stronger effect. And, and you, you can see here how this score, which describes the the disease uh, progression, it's uh, improved when, when you combine these two drugs. So just an illustrate how dynamic models can be applied to patients in, in, if you have enough material, in this case in blood, and then you can use them in this case to understand not only the differences in the signaling pathways between patients and healthy controls, but even to come up with hypotheses of drug combinations to treat. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing is how we could do this if you have solid tissues so if it's not blood it's very hard to get material from patients even if you have a cancer right you remove part of the tissue but often it's not a lot mm -hmm. uh, and for this we work together with christoph merton the time at embl now in epfl in lausanne and colleagues in the clinic in Aachen, Torsten Gram and ulf neumann to apply microfluidics to generate drug response data so the idea is that uh, in the same way that uh, uh, you encapsulate in droplet cells for doing single cell RNA, you can also encapsulate them with drugs. And um, by doing this, then uh, you can come up with, uh, if you like, mini drug response experiments. Uh, and here you can measure um, as a response either the, the like a space reporter. So you can see if apoptosis is induced. Or also you can sequence them with RNA-seq. Uh, and then again, with this data, uh, which uh, uh, you can uh, you can see here, how it's generated, right? So with these droplets that are automatically collected using microfluidics, it's a very fast process that needs very small amount of material. Uh, you can use that data 
in the same way as we saw before to build logic models. And again, it's the same trick. So in this case, for each of the patients, we have different drug response data. We have prior knowledge. And by training the knowledge to the data, we can build patient specific logic models. Mm. And this is a bit in some more detail, the underlying model. So because in that case, our readout was the activation of caspase 3 down here in the network. The model is constrained around the pathways upstream of it. But still, we could use it to build these logic models. We could look at differences between the patients. So you can see here the, the black arrow means uh, interactions that are active in all four patients. So these are patients, I forgot to say, uh, with pancreatic cancer, but different. Um, so two are the primary pancreatic cancer tumors. One is a liver metastasis, and one is a intrapepidial um, neoplasia. Uh, but all of them, had, when you train the models, all of them have this black arrow active. But then there are differences in some other components, which are shown here with these little boxes. So, so the different color means that in some cases, in some of the patients, one is active and the other one is not. Mm. But then again, this is a dynamic model. So we can use it not only to, to interpret the differences, but you can simulate it. So then here, we also try to simulate different drug combinations. So here on, on the right, and we try to see which drug combinations are more likely to be effective in certain patients. And uh, we could not, uh, uh, this is a way to generate hypotheses of which drug combinations to try on patients. Mm -hmm. We could not use it to go back to the patients, but uh, we could do a similar uh, exercise, both on cell lines and in mouse xenografts. And there we could show how the, the models provide us candidates of drug combinations that then were effective when, when treated uh, in a follow-up study. So with that, actually, uh, I finished the, the content uh, and the last couple of minutes, I'd like me to, to wrap up what I told you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the, the whole lab and in particular from uh, what I saw you today, Tennis built on the whole Omnipath resource, only added the multiomic integration. Uh, Ricardo did the heart study and, and Jovan did the, the methodology for spatial data. And this last part on, on the and the microfluidics modeling was led by Federica Duati, who is now assistant professor in Endoven. And these are our funders, uh, my, my conflict of interest, the funding from GSK, Sanofi, and also now Pfizer, and some fees from Traver and Aztex. Also, we have a number of collaborators. I, I mentioned them along the way for, for the specific uh, things I, I mentioned. And, uh, and just to summarize, I started talking about how we can use machine learning from omics data for personalized medicine. Uh, as I illustrated, even with the relatively simple case of prediction of drugs on, on cell lines, still is a long way to go to apply machine learning in this context. But that's why we think that the biological knowledge can increase the performance and interpretability, so it can be a helpful tool in this context. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I show you how we use this footprint idea to estimate key features like pathways and transcription factors how we can use uh, these approaches also for single cell and spatial technologies, which open a lot of new opportunities, but also come with their own challenges. And finally, how this dynamic model based on perturbation and, and on time series uh, can complement machine learning. It should be done in a more target way, but in those cases, uh, it's uh, also helpful. And so in general, our strategy is to take generic knowledge from databases and literature. This allows us to build a starting genetic model. But then we can train to patient-specific data uh, to generate a patient-specific model. And this data can be more direct measurements like phosphorylation, more indirect measurements like transcriptome or even phenotypic responses. But in all cases, then these patient-specific models can on one hand be used to get mechanistic insights, but also we can use it to predict uh, therapies. So all, all this work, uh, as I said at the beginning, is based on tools and resources that are free available. So we are really happy if this is helpful for you and we always welcome feedback on that. So yeah, with that, I'm done. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I stop recording?